Good morning, everybody, and happy Friday, and welcome to Decoding Digital. <clears throat> I'm Leon Cavley. I'm director here at Door 4, and uh, it's Door 4 that's presenting uh, today's event. <clears throat> uh, this is part of our regular series of webinars, content, and interviews uh, from Door 4. We're a performance marketing agency based here in the UK, servicing clients all over the UK, Europe, uh, and the USA. <clears throat> Today, we've got three fantastic speakers that we're going to welcome you to, um, all experts in the field, all performance marketing gurus uh, and people that I know are going to deliver some fantastic content to you, hopefully make it a great hour of your time. Um, we've got Lauren Futter, uh, our partner acquisition specialist from HubSpot. HubSpot should be a brand name well known to many of you marketers, those of you working in this industry. Uh, and today she brings her knowledge of marketing automation, sales and marketing alignment. And she's got a fantastic presentation that she will introduce shortly. We have Nick Bambre, who is a CRM a data and digital strategist uh, working from the Thread team. Uh, loads of experience, increasing engagement with global brands, refining customer insights through data and behavior. Uh, and I know this is going to be fantastic for those of you who uh, really want to learn how to get the most out of that, that customer data. Uh, and last but not, not least, we've got Sean Dwyer, who is a director here at Door 4 and my colleague. Uh, years of experience in performance marketing. Sean's really that expert on managing and leading performance teams uh, using data. And today he's talking about how brands reduce cost per lead uh, and scaling up efforts in a competitive marketplace. So um, a quick note about what uh, today's running order. Each of our three speakers are going to give you a, a 15 minute presentation, roughly. Um, we invite you to use the Q&A feature, which you'll see in the bottom of your Zoom window. Drop your questions for the speakers in there. And at the end of the three uh, talks, what we'll do, we'll collect these questions and we'll pose them to our guests and we'll invite everybody to come in and join us. Um, so without further ado, I'm actually going to move on to introduce our first guest. Lauren, would you like to join us in video, please? Good morning, Lauren. Thanks, Any, thanks good for joining morning. us. Thanks Great very much for inviting um, me. Yeah. Are you well this morning? I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, happy it's Friday and uh, so I'm sure I, we all had... A, a good few dozen people here ready to uh, hear your talk. I'm going to hand over to you and step aside. Over to you, Lauren. Sounds good. Thank you. Great. Can we all see that? I hope so. So um, I've got a few things to go through this morning in terms of the agenda, obviously the presentation um, today is on marketing automation and lead scoring, um, and particularly focusing around best practices for marketing and sales alignment. So um, I've got about four things to go through. Um, first of all, I just wanted to cover, you know, why is it so important to respond quickly to leads? Uh, because I think there is a bit of a uh, misconception around um, particularly um, how soon we should respond and, and what that can mean, I guess, in terms of um, the relationship between the business and, and, and a potential prospect. Um, secondly, we'll look at how to become more efficient in working leads, um, uh, especially in terms of prioritization. Um, and we'll look at some examples of lead scoring and marketing automation. Um, and the third part, we'll do the marketing and sales alignment and customer experience. So basically, you know, why, why do we want to align uh, sales and marketing? I think it's pretty obvious, but also what does that mean for the customer experience? And if you are looking at making a change, if you have problems around marketing and sales alignment, um, you know, how would you go about doing that? So what are the, some of the things you can look at? So I'm gonna just jump into present here so we can see. Great. So um, there are a couple of things that I think it is good to know when we consider, you know, why we need to be responsive um, to leads. Actually, uh, the last uh, statistic data shows that the response time for B2B companies in terms of uh, new leads, that's new leads coming in, is around 42 hours. Um, and uh, it's a little bit faster for digital leads. Uh, the average time is around 70, 17 hours. Um, uh, but the reason why it's actually really important to be so responsive, um, you can see the statistic here, 35% to 50% of sales actually go to the vendor that responds first. Now, why do you think that is? Um, well, I think it's it's actually quite natural for someone who enters into a buying process and who has a good experience with someone, first of all, to become investing in the buying process with you. So when you're the first one to start that relationship 
with a particular company, they already get invested. Um, they've already started spending time looking at a particular product, especially if they're already kind of ready to speak to sales. Um, you know, we can see that any company that's actually willing to commit sales reps or a sales team or whoever it is that takes care of sales in your business to quick and comprehensive follow-up strategy will quickly outperform the competition. We can see actually, um, in fact, that if the lead is contacted within the first five minutes, it actually has a nine times higher chance of converting. So these are pretty uh, strong statistics. Um, it's much like when you have a problem, you know, when you have a problem that you want to solve, imagine you have like a telephone contract, your internet's not working, pretty sure we've all experienced that recently. You know, it's very, very similar. You'd like to be contacted as soon as possible to solve that problem. Um, it's statistically anything longer than five minutes actually leads to an 80% decrease in lead qualification. So what can we do about this? I know that most companies are not able to deliver this at the moment. This is a fact, but it's something we really need to be focusing on and working on um, if we want to improve this process um, and have a better, a better chance of actually closing new business. So how should we actually gain efficiency with working leads? Because I think this is the biggest problem. You know, many people are, um, are, are actually spending a lot of time on a lot of different uh, uh, activities during the day. And leads, leads are not actually always, or, or incoming leads are not, the, not necessarily um, something that you know about all the time, um, or that you have a lot of time to um, see which actually are the ones you spend, spend time on. Um, there's nothing worse than uh, getting a new lead and quickly finding out thereafter it's actually not um, highly qualified. It's not really a fit for your business. So there are a couple of things that we can do to actually gain efficiencies. One, um, we should focus on the most promising ones. So that means we need to define the characteristics of what is a good lead, first of all. When should we trigger sales to reach out? When should we hand back to marketing if it's too early to speak? Then we need to have a way to nurture and notify when leads move into a, next, an, into a new stage. So if it becomes a lead, if it becomes a marketing qualified lead or a sales qualified lead or back and forth. We can do number one in terms of focusing on the most promising leads um, with a lead scoring, with a lead scoring tool. I'm gonna to show you what that looks like in HubSpot in just a second. And number two, we can achieve with marketing automation. And obviously there are, there are many different platforms that you can use to, to achieve this. I'm gonna show you a household example um, because that's exactly what I know. Um, but let's look closely um, at what lead scoring is first. So in HubSpot, that looks like a score between one and a hundred. You can base that score off of actions taken by your contacts, such as engagement with content and emails, page visits or demographic attributes. So, you know, a CFO or um, a, a, co a company from a particular industry um, and attribute that to an automatic increase or decrease in the score. This can be done automatically. Well, essentially it can be predictive uh, based on things like um, AI, um, again, different demographics. Um, this is something that we have as part of HubSpot as HubSpot as a tool, or we can define that by you. Um, so these can be built out custom by you in terms of what contributes, uh, or what, what constitutes an actual positive or negative attribute in terms of an action that could be taken. This is what's gonna enable you to identify leads and separate them from the leads that are a little bit less interested. So here's an example um, screenshot here in terms of what the HubSpot score looks like, but this is um, a little bit, um, unclear and small, so we're going to jump directly into the tool to have a look at what that looks like. Here we have the HubSpot score. So um, we can see here on the right hand side, we have a lot of positive, we have positive attributes and we have negative attributes on the left hand side. We can build these out ourselves. Um, so essentially we can, we can work out and, and this is something that, you know, marketing and sales need to be aligned on in terms of what actually constitutes positive action and what constitutes negative. So we see here, somebody clicked um, three marketing emails. So number of marketing emails clicks is greater than three. We're gonna increase the score by 25. If they opened a sales email less than seven days ago, um, or if they've um, seen a particular page, this is another good indication. I might have here something like contact us page, if they even visited the contact us page. Um, so 
actually make, we can see that that is a part of positive action, even if they haven't filled out that form. Something that might constitute a negative action. So they've opted out of a blog subscription. They have less than two page views. Um, you can add a number of different examples here and, and really it's up to you in terms of defining, as I said, the characteristics of what a good lead is um, and when we might want that score to reach a certain point. And that's when we're gonna start to look at the, uh, the, the marketing automation piece as well in terms of what happens next, what happens after a lead hits a certain point. So that's when we might want to trigger marketing automation. Marketing automation um, should really be about, um, it, it can be very tempting to hand off to sales as quickly, you know, as soon as there's some kind of interaction. So if there is a, you know, a, a form submission, this is really probably not enough to indicate high intent. Um, when there are multiple interactions, um, when there's yeah a lot of, uh, different uh, stakeholders, say, in a particular company that are taking those actions, and maybe a, a better indication of, you know, when it's time to, to reach out. Marketing automation, uh, the purpose is to take away the heavy lifting required for that nurturing. So imagine, you know, if you have to create these actions um, yourself, if you have to send an email every time someone uh, submits, a, submits a form or takes a particular action, it's going to take a lot of time. It's going to be almost uh, a full-time job to, to get that done. Marketing automation uses personalization. So to drive different personas down different nurturing paths, the content that you might wanna show a CEO is a bit different to what you might wanna show uh, an individual contributor in, in a business. That also enables you to alert the sales team when the time is right to connect. So let's look at a, an example of how we do that in HubSpot. I've got two examples of workflows here that I want to show you. The first one is about lead prioritization. So here we're using the HubSpot score. So we're actually using that same score that we looked at um, as part of our, our HubSpot lead scoring properties. So here I've got lead score is greater than 50. Call someone, call that contact immediately. And I've created a task here directly for the sales team. I've implemented my service level average. So what I want to implement of a service level average of five minutes. If after five minutes, that task has then been completed, we're not going to take any further action because <clears throat> effectively we know that the sales team is taking care of that, let's say. If that actually hasn't happened, after five minutes, we may want to you know, make sure that person gets contact. So we might actually rotate to a new owner and create a new task so that that person can see that person, that that lead really should be contacted um, with priority because they've increased their score over 50. This is an easy way to know, you know, whether, whether someone, you know, is a high priority contact um, through the lead scoring property. The second example I want to show is a little bit more complicated. So um, here we've got two examples of qualification criteria for what uh, characteristics or what actions need to be taken or essentially what criteria that contact needs to fulfill for that person to be enrolled in the workflow. So we've got here, someone has filled out the contact sales form and their role is any of CFO, CEO, so we're using the C level. Or that person has filled out the contact sales pay, uh, form and their lead score is greater than 40. So first of all, we're gonna assign a task call priority contact they submitted the contact form. If that has then been completed, um, we're going to, first of all, if it's completed, then you know we know that that's been taken care of. If it hasn't, we can actually integrate with other tools here. So we send a Slack notification, hot lead, please follow up. So send a Slack notification to that person who should be taking care of it. If that task has then been completed, uh, we might set that that contact property lifecycle stage to sales qualified lead because we know they did actually um, express intent of having contact from sales. If after one day, we wanna check whether an opportunity has been created. So um, if that opportunity is being confirmed and we can check that, uh, we wanna set that lifecycle stage to qualified lead. If none of these criteria have been met, we want to decrease the contact property lead score by 25 because actually that person wasn't as interested as we originally thought. 
then we want to set the life cycle stage of marketing qualified lead and add to back burner contacts. So that means um, that lead has actually been um, demoted, let's say, and handed back to the marketing team for a further analysis and further treatment. So that means they could be enrolled in additional marketing automation flows. They may need content marketing. We may want to, you know, look back again in terms of when that lead score increases. Um, or take you know other other actions in terms of um, depending on what that that lead does um, from there on out. So so we can see you know marketing is doing everything up until the MQL stage to provide a lead that is qualified for sales. Sales then must follow a process to close that lead into a customer. It's really important that these steps be well-defined. We also need to know when a hand of contact bag does not write ready to process, to progress. The gap between the marketing and sales goal here between MQL and client is where we need to ensure that, for example, that our SLAs are, ma are met and we input a feedback loop, like in the examples that you've seen with the, the lead scoring and marketing automation. Often, you know, this is not the case. Um, so we need to make sure that our marketing and sales teams are aligned. Um, there's a mutual benefit here for both teams. Um, and there are a couple of things that are, are really important to get right from the outset. Um, sharing key metrics is, is one um, that I think that you definitely need to look at initially because there is no point in having an SLA right for sales to reach out if sales can't meet that SLA, SLA and there's no point um, in having an SLA like that if the leads that we're receiving are not highly qualified or not really ready. So we need to go back and analyze. Um, but the reason why we want to you know, have mutual goals for marketing and sales is gonna keep both, these, both of these teams focused on results. Um, and both teams can actually feed back to each other with really great insight into, um, you know, what could be done and what could be improved. So, you know, while marketers are critical, for example, for co conducting customer research and in understanding the needs of audiences and prospects, you know, it's important to remember that marketing, you know, that, that sales reps are actually the ones who speak directly to prospects and customers on a daily basis. So, you know, while working with your marketing team, you know, might, you could actually collaborate with sales to leverage you know, customer insight for upcoming campaigns or content. So making sure that we feedback both ways. You may be familiar if you know HubSpot and you know our methodology um, around um, marketing and sales versus the flywheel. We actually killed the flywheel. Uh, sorry, we killed the funnel um, a couple of years ago now. Um, so just looking at how we can take this a step further, um, in terms of marketing and sales alignment. Here, we've got this kind of typical marketing funnel, which we all knew and loved, um, with the customers kind of coming out the bottom. And one of the reasons why we might do this in terms of you know, market, aligning marketing and sales is because it's not just important for teams to have mutual expectations, but it's really important for customer experience and the impact that customer experience can have on ongoing lead generation and referral-based business. So, you know, it's, it's good to think about how this process is going to look, but actually we shouldn't forget either that these customers can be a really good source of new business. Um, and this is where the, the flywheel methodology comes in, where HubSpot as a, as a company has actually brought these, these three kind of areas of any new business, uh, of any kind of, um, of, a, of customer facing teams, the marketing, the sales and the service into the same system. Here, creating a, a single customer view. So all of the interactions that happen with marketing um, and the, all of the interactions that happen with sales and all of the interactions that happen with service teams can sit within the same system. When we're actually able to remove the friction between these areas, remove the friction between marketing and sales, service, um, even understanding, for example, service on this team understanding, you know, why your customer bought from you, what journey they went through to actually um, arrive there, feeding back through to know how we can do better, we're more likely to produce more, um, more happy customers. So more promoters of the business, uh, which are going to feed back into this marketing funnel, uh, which will be, which will be potential customers that your sales team will speak to. So 
understanding and knowing, you know, how you can improve the customer experience um, can be a very powerful way to, um, to, to improve this wheel, to, to actually get that, that cycle um, spinning correctly. Here, I've just got a quote from the CEO of QuickBooks, um, you know, and it's a, it's, a, it's a really good point here that's just furthering from the kind of flywheel methodology. You know, when you can align marketing and sales, you make it easy for your prospects to engage, engage with your sales team. You can implement a process that makes sense in terms of qualification requirements. You should structure your technology around this process to reflect it. And, you know, don't forget the process of managing you know, the process of handing off to the service team. So when you give a great a great service, don't also, you know, don't be afraid as well to be practically asking for, for referrals. So, you know, always looking at how we can improve um, our customer experience at every kind of um, step of the, the way in, um, in your interactions with your, with your prospects. So I know that um, when this, this kind of uh, utopian, <laughs> Uh, look at um, marketing and sales alignment can be a little daunting and can seem very far away from perhaps where you are at the moment um, in your business. Um, but um, there is a way, there is a place to start. And um, I think that really starts with taking a good look at your current processes and systems. So can you achieve your service level average in terms of, you know, uh, both for, for your current, for your prospects and your, and your customers? Um, Set yourselves um, your your goals for your marketing and your in your sales teams in terms of you know where are those kind of mutual goals. So from for marketing uh, marketing goals might be goals in terms of traffic, leads, uh, MQLs. For sales, that might look like ops, demos, deals, or revenue. Um, we need to look at whether these teams have the right tools available to them to achieve their goals, the right processes. Um, you know everyone needs to be on the same page for this to work. Um, who's going to be involved in terms of executing uh, particular parts of the process? And these goals that we set should be specific. So they should be SMART goals, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. Especially, I think, focusing on the time frame. Um, you know, if we don't set a time frame for seeing improvement or um, implementing changes, um, you know, we're really realistically unlikely to hold ourselves accountable to those, to those changes and to those goals. And lastly, uh, feedback loops. So whether that looks like communication channels or reporting, um, we should set up correct reports so we know, you know how things are working on both sides, um, but also especially communication channels. So that could look like uh, Slack, it could be email, it could be meetings, it could be CRM, um, in terms of you know, how your feedback, how things are going on, on from a marketing perspective and from a sales perspective. Um, regular feedback and communication is really important to make sure that um, you know we, we know what is going on. Uh, if we don't communicate, there's no there's no chance for us to, to actually improve these processes. Um, I've included a marketing and sales uh, service level average template. If you're thinking about um, implementing a marketing and sales SLA um, like the one you saw earlier, um, there's a great way to get started in terms of you know how you would actually get started in in this process and implementing um, change to your, to your marketing and sales alignment. Thank you very much. Um, I hope it was helpful for you um, to see some examples of lead scoring and marketing automation um, and how we would do that in HubSpot in terms of um, creating better marketing and sales alignment. Um, and I hope you have uh, some questions for me at the end. Thanks very much, Lauren. That, that was excellent. That. And as a B2B marketer uh, myself and, and working in an agency that, that use HubSpot, uh, we can certainly vouch for the fact that HubSpot and other marketing automation tools that are available really do help businesses differentiate between activity and those uh, leads that are kicking around the website and those that are showing real intent and how the sales team can really take advantage and really put attention into qualified leads. So um, with that, that's, we're going to uh, hand over to Nick Bambury, who's our, um, our next speaker. Uh, Nick joins us from the Thread team. Uh, good morning, Nick. How are you? Good morning, morning. I'm good, thanks. I think, are we? Good to go. Have we got audio? Yes, I think we're, we're all good. Um, yeah, Nick, this morning is going to be talking about using data and, and CRM for really gaining insight from customers. I'm not going to try and spoil uh, your presentation, Nick. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand straight over to you.
Great. Um, thanks, everyone. And thanks for, the for inviting me along to this. It should be fun. Um, what I'll talk to you about today, once I get this actually uh, displayed properly, uh, what I'll talk to you about today is going to be uh, one of our clients, uh, an, auto an automated manufacturer. You will know them, and I will tell you who that is in a sec, and how we uh, dealt with the huge amount of interest that we had in a, a new car that we're launching uh, at the same time that pand the pandemic hit. So just a couple of words about the people I'm working with, the Thread team. So uh, the Thread team is kind of a, a loose, it's loose, uh, what, do you, what would you call that? A, a, a group of like-minded freelancers, effectively, and contractors who uh, noticed a lot of agencies were talking the talk about CRM and, and personalization and uh, and creating excellent customer experiences, but weren't really walk, able to walk the walk or weren't walking the walk at all. They were just kind of putting it in a pitch and then leaving it to someone else to do. So um, interestingly enough, um, the two founders, Richard and Carolyn, and uh, were, were working on a client, the client that I'm going to talk to you about, um, with an agency who were pitching for them. So they, they helped them out write the kind of CRM and data part of that pitch and how they would target people and how they could improve on what they're doing with their customer experiences and so on. And uh, the client then went, uh, the agency then went on to win that pitch and immediately then said to the thread team, guys, we need you to work with us on this. So we became white labeled into the agency. And the client, um, oh, so what that, sorry, the client, I'll tell you who that is, it was Mini. So we're working for uh, Mini Automotive. You're very familiar with them, I'm sure. And what we provide to them through the agency is um, around all the areas of branding, customer experience, strategy, um, MarTech information about how they could be using their automation, marketing automation better, uh, insight and analytics, et cetera, et cetera. We combine that with all the other stuff that the agency is actually doing in terms of what they're doing around copy and around what they're doing around creative. And we, we make sure we work very closely together with them. But the, from the client's perspective, we're the same people. There's just a, a, a lot of the clients we work with. We do work with some big brands, but we also work with any brand. So um, it's just obviously when you're doing a big a deck like this, you obviously work with the biggest agency, the biggest clients on there. So anyway, uh, on to the mini electric stuff, which is the interesting bit for you guys, I'm sure. Um, what, we, what I'm basically trying to illustrate here is how we convert interest into orders, uh, or alternatively, as someone said, it, you don't need a showroom to sell a car, which is pretty controversial to a car company. Anyway, here's the situation. Uh, so we've been spending two years or so hyping up the, the new mini electric um, and it had been on Top Gear, we'd had loads of ads on TV, we'd been running press, we'd been running all sorts of CRM stuff and there was obviously a lot of hype, we'd signed up, we got people who'd never driven one of these cars to start pre-ordering it, we'd got people to hold their hands up and say I want you to keep me informed specifically about Mini Electric, I'm really interested and the car it was due to go to, I think it was the 7th of March, it was due to go into the dealerships to be uh, available for test drive, excuse me. But then we all know what happened, lockdown. So obviously confidence got hit as soon as there was a pandemic started. No one really knew what the heck was going on. Um, and at the beginning of lockdown, everything was shut. So, you know, showrooms across the UK completely shut. We had um, people who had put this deposit down who weren't able to drive the car. And we were like, oh, hang on, what if they cancel their order? They've never driven it, they might be nervous. And then in general around the electric vehicle kind of market, there's still concerns about range, cost, how do you service them? What's the differences? In, Quite hard to get that across when you're talking to a, a, a retailer face to face. So our challenge was how we could build on the hype that we'd already generated and turn it into consideration and orders, even though you know there's this pandemic going on and we can't actually speak face to face with people. Uh, so basically, what we wanted to do is make sure they were engaged. The people that had already raised their hands, uh, make sure they were engaged and excited all the way up to the point when they knew Mini Electric arrived. But we also wanted to build up more of a base of prospects and leads and, and orders as well. Um, and the way to do that, we obviously, I would say this, is to look at the data and come up with a way we could tailor messaging to different people depending on what they were up to at the time. Um, so we looked at web behavior, what people were browsing, we looked at email engagement, what people were, um, uh, you know, how they were interacting with emails, how many people had signed up for our interest registers and pre-orders. And, and, and doing that, we came up with three kind of grouped, group key audiences, I guess. And, and they're pretty simple, really. It's like people, people who aren't engaged at all, the unengaged, so people who, who don't know much about Mini Electric. Then we've got those interested people in the middle who engage with Mini Coms and then browse the website, the, the electric uh, portion of the website, or they've signed up and or they've signed up for specifically asking for more info. And then we've got the advocates. Obviously, these are the people who placed an order with us, uh, and therefore we know they're pretty high up on the list of advocacy. Um, 
for each audience, we, we looked at, uh, then looked at what we could do in terms of communications for them to make sure that we were matching what they wanted to know about or what we thought they wanted to know about. So for the first and engaged group, what we really needed to keep doing was hyping the feeling, making sure that we could convert them into interested and then onto advocates. For those that had already said they were interested, wanted to keep that hype going so they became orderers. And then obviously for the people who had already ordered, we wanted to make sure they didn't cancel those orders and that they started kind of telling, everyone, telling their friends all about them as well. So first step for the hype and the feeling that this is the people who are kind of unengaged. I'm not going to read through the, all the bullets, don't worry. But basically what we did is we, we created a series of comms that went out and they weren't uh, automated anyway. They were kind of built bespoke for um, uh, messages that we wanted to send. And they were raising awareness about Mini Electric, giving people links through to the re relevant show, uh, uh, landing pages so they could understand more about how it worked. Um, we obviously wanted them to give us their details so that we could sign them onto the interest register. So there was a lot of calls to action around that. And um, we also had, we have a general uh, monthly email kind of newsletter, although I don't like the word newsletter, but an email that goes out every month that just tells people mini stories. It's not really a sales tool. It's more of a, a branding tool. And um, we included a lot of stories about electric in that. That was the, one of the uh, popular subjects we noticed. And then what happened was anyone that engaged with these comms, even if they didn't actually directly sign up for the interest register itself, we were able to see that, you know, there are some people that are really engaging with, the, with these emails. Let's do something with them that's different to maybe everyone else. And it helped feed into the next step, which was our, uh, um, which was the turning the hype into orders. But really the aim of the initial bit, the, the initial hype in the feeling was that we wanted to drive traffic to the website and get them to sign up to the, inter uh, to the interest register. As you can see here, I mean, it's probably a bit hard to, see very clearly but every time we did an email campaign there were spikes so the email campaigns are you know the spikes in the yellow uh yellow line on, on the top chart are basically uh, traffic to the electric web page so they really really do correlate nicely to any emails that we send out so the emails are doing their job um and but what, what they're also doing so the job to drive into the website is one thing but the website is also doing its job because it's getting people to sign up for the interest register and also to pre-order so you can see there's those yellow the yellow spikes on the bottom chart there are people signing up for the interest register at various key points and then the black um slightly harder to read but the black um spikes are pre-orders there's a huge spike of pre-orders just at launch when it actually became available for pre-order so the real early adopters signed up then so we got all these people hyped up. We want to get them to <laughs> convert them into orders. So what we what, what do we do is really we need to convince them to book a book a test drive or place an order, and that's when we got uh, we built the an always on program and kind of automated uh, regular sends a series of five emails over the course of three weeks, um, starting off quite light, talking about how exciting it will be to drive your car, uh, to have a mini electric, building up in in terms of what we were asking people to do, telling them about charging and range. We called it our interest in nurture program, which ties quite nicely with what Lauren was saying. Um, and the emphasis kind of to get people to do something built over time. So by the end of the email, there was lots of uh, more uh, obvious calls to action, such as order now or book a test drive. And we sent this to two groups. We had the group of people that had signed up and told us they read it and wanted to hear about Mini Electric. But we also had this other group, what we called implied interest. They're the people that had engaged with emails or visited the website but hadn't signed up for any interest register, but were really looking about uh, on the website and through the media for mini electric information. That gave us an extra pool of data, effectively, which was what, what, what we needed. There wasn't a, the interest register was big, but it was, you know, the more data you can get, the better. And, and it was, um, it basically pretty much doubled the available audience for us and actually delivered fairly comparable results, which you'll see now. So, I mean, the first thing to note is very strong open rates anyway on both of the um, segments that we sent out to. But um, for, for the implied interest where they hadn't actually hand raised, we were very pleased to see such an open rate. We, we didn't expect the click-through open rate to be quite as high because they weren't at, as far down the journey as people on the interest register were, but it was still encouraging to see that, that kind of performance for that data. And we've obviously rolled out that approach for other parts of the business now. Um, and the other main point here was that even during lockdown, which you can see in this bottom chart, the kind of dip in the orange um, uh, orange areas around March to May, March to the well, whole of April and some of March and some of May, that was lockdown one. And even then we were getting a trickle of leads in, a few orders, and then as, as, as lockdown um, was relaxed again, there's a much bigger spike, and there's a really big spike in, I think that big one you can see in July time is when retail is fully opened up. 
Um, so that so that kind of did its job for us. And then we had this third set of people, the people that we wanted to, that were advocates, we wanted to make sure they didn't cancel. So we also gave them a little, uh, only a short program, but it was, we called it our order nurture program. So when they when they placed their pre-order, they got a little email celebrating the fact that they were going to become part of the Mini Electric. And then a week or so later, they'd get another email saying, um, telling them about charging, how to get a wall box put in, where they should contact, uh, you know, apps and things they could look at like zap map to help them find electric charges and so on so right how it would be to actually live with the electric car and then the third uh, email was um just before it went to production it was uh, last chance to add any extras if you want to or to change color of mind and all that kind of stuff and then they were fed through to another automated program which we call all the status program and that you can see is kind of a series of uh, emails about the progress how the how the build's getting on it started being built as a picture of it getting painted not actually of it getting painted but it's personalized enough so it it's the same color as what they've ordered and the spec of the car is shown so if they've got certain alloys the right alloys are shown on the picture and so on so it, it feels like it's their car even though obviously it's smoke and mirrors in a way um and then this is this is the bit that blew us away when we were looking at the results it's the opening especially the opening rates just ridiculous um You'd expect people to be excited, but even so, 80 percent, seventy-seven percent, whatever it is, ridiculous uh, and really good click-to-open rates. Particularly the last one, the build your your mini electric. We were we were pleased about that because that was the one where we were pushing people to try and uh, upgrade or buy extras, and it seemed to have a good impact on the overall um, performance. Um, so it's really that's it. I mean, it's a summary, but. Um, the key takeaways for each of the things that we did was for hyping the feeling, the aim was to get more people interested. We saw a boost in web traffic of 13%. Sorry, we saw that 30% of all web traffic went to the mini electric page in 2020. In 2019, there wasn't even a mini electric page for most of it. So we were, it was almost, a, we were answering a need that was, was already there, but we created a place for them to go. The other thing that's important in car purchases configurations when people play on the website to pick their spec, and we saw that 32% of all configurations in 2020 were for Mini Electric. Considering there's five other models of Mini, that's pretty good. <laughs> in terms of the hyped orders, we beat our orders target by 15%, which is no small feat. I, can't, I would love to give you the real numbers, but they won't let me. Um, and what that meant was because we beat our order target, the production couldn't keep up with the order. So it actually sold out. People were ordering cars in 2020 that they couldn't get until 2021, which is a great situation to be in especially for a business that in an uncertain pandemic. And then on the orders to onboarders side, we had a really good, obviously you saw those in email engagement levels, which were ridiculous. Um, but the, the key thing really was cancellation was low. Minis average is around about 10% canceled orders. So it was less than 5% for the people that ordered the mini electric. Uh, so everyone was happy. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Nick. That's uh, it's great to. Oh, sorry, I'll just turn that off there. It's great to hear uh, real life stories of how uh, marketing and, and attention to data and customer engagement really helps build the brand. I think what's what's really interesting for me there, Nick, is the attention to not just building initial interest in the brand, but actually creating that lifetime value with that post purchase engagement. Where yeah. I think lots of marketers, and certainly in smaller operations tend to focus mainly on higher up in the funnel and trying to create that early interest where uh, these examples show that, that that attention to data and engagement matters all the way across yeah. that, that customer yeah. lifecycle. Um, so thanks for that and the uh, demonstration of scale. Speaking of scale, I'm going to introduce Sean Dwyer, my colleague here from Door 4, who joined us all the way from the Door 4 boardroom, 10 metres over that way, socially distanced. Good morning to you, Sean. Hi, how are you doing? Good to see you. Um, Sean, this morning is going to be talking about reducing cost per lead and scaling up. So uh, Sean explains it much, much better than I do. Without further ado, over to you, Sean Dwyer. No pressure. No pressure. OK, uh, let's grab up this. If everyone can see my presentation, we'll go. So, yeah, I've just summarised five ways that I believe uh, companies can go about reducing their cost per acquisition um, while still scaling up, I think. Some people see it as a, um, a, an either or. I can either get a low cost per lead, but low volume, or I can get loads of volume at a high cost per lead. But I think we can put some methodologies in to get a good blend. So today I'll talk you through them. So just a quick uh, context on me. Uh, I no longer have the beard, as you can see uh, from a lovely picture. Um, I do love line graphs. So there's going to be a lot of line graphs today. I like ellipsis. Um, 
I enjoy a cartoon as well. So I'm going to do a lot of explanation through cartoons today. Um, and I hate wasted uh, advertising. So we're going to talk a lot about how we can reduce that wastage. Um, so as I say, today you'll see lots of cartoons, you see lots of line graphs, uh, but you won't see any beards. Um, and I have about 16 seconds per slide. So I'm going to go quick. So try and keep up guys. Um, and this permanent marker font that I love uh, appears a lot as well. So context, where the cool kids hang out. Um, we're going to talk a lot about Facebook and Google guys because um, they are the dominant players in the digital advertising space. They take up about 61% of all digital advertising spend. That's 24% of all ad spend. Um, so we're going to talk a lot about them today because that's where people spend their time. Um, how have they got to these numbers? Because they are distraction artists. That's how I see them. Um, there are 3.8 million searches per minute on Google, which is scary. Um, but moreover, I think it's this stat on the left-hand side that I think scares a lot of us. Uh, the social media usage on average across every person that's on it uh, is two, and a, uh, two hours, uh, 24 minutes uh, per day. Um, that's the equivalent of about six years and eight months per lifetime. So, so these guys are the ones that we're going to focus on in terms of getting traffic to sites. We're going to talk a little bit about when they get to your site as well. Um, but I just wanted to uh, make it clear and give context to how I think uh, we can get the best CPLs for businesses. So firstly, uh, when we're looking at um, um, my five rules that I've put down here, we're going to make sure that we're talking to the right people consistently. Um, so, you know, out of the five ways to reduce cost per acquisition while scaling up, this one sort of lives across all of it. If you're not talking to the right people, um, then you're not going to be able to scale up and you're not going to be able to get a low cost per acquisition. So this is the kind of the key. If we can start with this one. Um, I'm sure you've all seen the uh, quote from John Wanamaker. Um, half my advertising spend is wasted, half it's effective. Uh, the trouble is you don't know which half is it which. Um, and I think that's where I think in digital, we have more information now to try and help that. Um, but I still think that there's still wastage out there. And uh, what I'm gonna try and do is give you some tips on improving that. Um, I think it all comes down to this cartoon on the right hand side, uh, which is relevant. I think that's what, people are vying for. Uh, they want to be distracted. They spend their lives looking at Facebook. Um, they want to um, find and resonate with a brand uh, that is relevant. So we're going to talk a little bit about how we can do that. The primary way to do that um, is, sorry, I've got loads of heads in, in the way. Uh, and I can't see my slides very well. Uh, so the primary way I context this is in the Google model, see, think, do, care. Uh, we talk about that a lot uh, here at Door 4 uh, and try and build methodologies and, and strategies around this framework. What it does is it gives us uh, clues in a digital footprint. Uh, people want different things throughout the journey and the life cycle. And I think Nick articulated that very nicely with his mini analogy. So I won't spend too long dwelling on this. Um, but what we can do from an advertising perspective is pick up on that footprint. Facebook and Google give us all them indicators uh, in the tools. Um, so the truth is out there. We just need to find it when we start campaigns and start strategies. And it's out there for free a lot of the time. So we've got here top right, this is Facebook audience insights. So just Google that after the fact. Uh, we can send it along with the presentation afterwards as well. Links to all of these. Um, but you can see what kind of demographic like your Facebook page versus the people that are on Facebook. Uh, on the left-hand side here, this is a, called Quantcast. This is, again, similar demographic data, um, but based on people that come to your website. And similar down here, we've got analytics, uh, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. And in the bottom right-hand side, one of my favorite tools is still the Keyword Planner from Google Ads. So there's a lot of information already out there. We can get the context um, of our audiences quite quickly, quite readily available. I think sometimes we assume it's hard and, and not attainable, um, but it is. And at least it gives us a starting point. So I think this is a key point uh, that's found across the discussion today. And then once you find that audience, test it. Um, you know, we talk a lot about micro moments. That's what See, Think, Do, Care is all about. Uh, it's about taking intent, context and immediacy and making sure that, that we push that into action, whether that's clicking on an ad, whether that's converting and becoming a sale. Um, so if you get that audience right, that micro moment becomes a lot easier to come by. Um, and then on the right hand side, what I've got here is a graph that everyone else in the business hates, but I, I really like showing off. This is showing basically that the higher you up are on a search engine listing, uh, the higher your conversion rate is. And this is my point here at the top, hunker down. You know, once you find that audience that works, keep doing it and do more of it and do it more aggressively. 
Um, I think what I find in the industry a lot when I talk to people is that they um, just like the next new thing, the next creative thing. They try to do new things all the time, but budgets stay the same. Um, and I think if you've got a winning strategy, keep doing what you're doing. Don't try and, uh, and find something new. So just some stats here. I'm not going to dwell on these uh, too long, but there is conflicts in the market uh, between uh, short-term activation plans and long-term marketing effects. And I think we need to hunker down on making sure we keep a strategy for a long time. And another cartoon here, uh, just a, f a funny marketoonist about TikTok because um, it's one of my bugbears in the market and people want to advertise on TikTok despite, you know, maybe that doesn't fit with their audience. It does fit with a lot of audiences, but maybe not yours. So we've got to make sure the strategy is around your audience, not around the platform we're talking about. Speaking of the platforms, I'm going to now speak about Facebook specifically. Um, so the first thing in Facebook is we've got to remember it's a social uh, platform and what a social platform is or lives and breathes off is content. Um, so this is uh, rule number two is feed the machine, you know, make sure that we're giving Facebook what it's after, which is more content. Um, and we're talking specifically about advertising here. So I'll go into detail here. Um, and these first two uh, next two rules that I've got uh, feed the machine and the next one around Google is about reducing cost in these in these platforms. Um, so I'm sure we've all been there. We've all been scrolling through Facebook and, um, you know, Subway butts in with its nice, um, did you want to order something, you know, get out of our feed. You, you're irrelevant at that point. So it's all about relevance. It's all about, uh, as I was just talking about, getting the audience right and getting your messaging right. Um, what we want to do uh, from an advertising perspective as well is freshen that up frequently. What this graph shows is uh, CPCs increase the more that a user sees an ad. Uh, and that's because A, the algorithm goes against you, but B, you're less likely, if you didn't resonate the first time they saw it or the second time they saw it, you're probably not going to resonate the ninth time they saw it. So the algorithm is all about saying, well, you pay cheaper for less frequency because you're more likely to engage as a user uh, first or second time around. So keep it fresh, keep more ads going into the machine and keep feeding it. Um, and it, I know this sounds like massive creative costs, but the advantage of social platforms is you don't have to have the best creative, it just needs to be good creative because tomorrow they're going to be looking at something else from your brand. Um, and just some examples here from, from one of our clients. Um, you know, this is my point around creative costs. You know, this similar asset has been re-engineered five different ways in different ads. So it's not just about the creative, it's about the different ad formats you use, it's about the text, it's, you know, moving these things around and just making sure there's something different and something um, that can um, persuade someone in their feed to take their attention away from scrolling because um, we've got that half a second that we need to try and uh, accomplish their attention. Um, pro tip here as well, use video. Uh, engagement is far higher on the social platforms. Just when I say that, I mean Facebook, uh, Instagram typically, um, but I'm sure we've all seen the same stats around LinkedIn as well. Um, so yeah, try and get your hands on uh, video content. Uh, it doesn't have to be, as I say, um, the most polished video content. It can just be showing off your product. Uh, one of our best performing ads in door four in the last year or so was just the MD of a baby brand showing how his cop um, came together. And you know, that was the best performing ad for a year. Um, so it can be relatively simple as well. Should have put that example in here in hindsight. Um, let's talk about Google ads. Uh, apologies, I know I'm going quick. We will send the deck afterwards, uh, but understanding quality score in Google search specifically, I think this is a critical um, aspect that we see missing a lot when we're pitching for work or when we're uh, speaking to potential new clients, uh, not understanding quality score and its effect on your account. Um, so in search, understanding quality score is the key to getting your cost per acquisition down, uh, or at least reducing the cost on the front end in terms of pulling that traffic cost down. And again, bring it back to relevance. I'm going to continue doing this all the way through today's topics. Um, but Google rewards that relevance. Google's first mission when they started out, and it's still a mission, is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful uh, to all users. The only way they're going to do that is by making sure that search engine is as relevant as possible. So as an advertiser, we want to make sure we're bidding on keywords that are relevant for us. You know, if we're selling umbrellas, we shouldn't be bidding on cats and dogs, or it might be raining cats and dogs out there. Um, so it's an auction. This is the thing about quality score. It's a metric in the auction system that we all have to pay attention to. Google gives access to it. We can see what it is. But what we can see here is this CPC is in the auction um, position one is willing to pay less than position two, but they take position one because their quality score is higher. 
And that's the key here is we're making sure we're getting them quality scores as high as possible. So we can pay less. You know, we're buying the media cheaper than our competitors. And this is what it looks like. Um, this is from, from WordStream, which I'm sure you're all uh, aware of. Um, but as the quality score uh, moves out of that sort of seven benchmark, uh, it either gets discounted uh, or it increases uh, if you're lower than uh, market average. So we want to make sure that from our perspective, um, we're getting the eights, the nines, the tens, because we know then we're paying less than our competitors. And just to doff our own cap, you know, this is where we hang out. You know, we, our averages are about uh, 8.5 at the moment, which is uh, where we want to be as a business. Um, but how? How do we do that? So these are the five areas that uh, Google have always talked about, uh, the industry talks about, CTR, uh, account structure, landing page relevance, ad copy effectiveness, and uh, historic performance. I'll go into each one of these individually um, very quickly. And um, what is advantageous here is that you kind of get three for the price of two, in my view. Uh, CTR is affected by your ad copy effectiveness and your account structure. Um, so uh, CTR kind of takes care of itself out of them five. Uh, it's worth noting historical performance basically means are you a consistent advertiser on Google? Uh, because if you're not, then they penalize you. It's the cynics view of it. Um, so we've got two taken care of before we even started. So we only have to analyze the three. Um, account structure. So this is the little known trick uh, that we see missed a lot in uh, the industry. Uh, which is when you've got an account, uh, presuming you all know what match types are, you've got exact match, you've got phrase match, you've got broad match. Um, what we need to make sure is that we've got negative exact match keywords placed against the phrase match and the broad match. That ensures that these keywords don't compete with these keywords. Because um, as soon as we don't have that negative keyword in there, we're bidding against ourselves effectively in our own account before we even account for the competitors. So we need to make sure that we're not competing with ourselves as, as step one uh, to a good quality score. Um, and then ad copy effectiveness. So you can see here two ads uh, for door four where we're just showing off the prominence and also the relevance. You know, this is a project management job. We mentioned project manager uh, at least three times in that advert there. So again, it's not, it's not about keyword stuffing, but it is about making sure that we are relevant as possible and then we grab the attention of the user. Uh, and the other way you grab attention of the user is by using the extensions for their full list and taking up as much of the search engine as you can see, this right-hand side example of one of our clients uh, takes up the whole search engine on mobile uh, because of the amount of extensions we've got in there. And again, we've got that relevance in there. And finally, we're going to talk about website a little bit later on, uh, but landing page effectiveness um, is uh, also an indicator to quality score. So that takes into account your site speed and your bounce rate. You know, if Google can see you going to uh, a user going to a website and coming back, um, then they will grade you down in terms of quality score. Um, and the way to make sure that we don't get graded down is by making sure we're relevant again. So are we selling what's being bought? And I think an industry that does do this very well is the gambling industry. I'm not a big gambler myself, but I do know that they do a lot more around um, uh, ensuring uh, landing pages are relevant. So I've looked for Liverpool versus Rome odds here, and you can see uh, that landing pages specifically what I've searched for. So I know I don't need to go anywhere else because this is what I've, I've, I've got the intent for at this point. Um, so that's it in terms of quality score, in terms of ad fatigue in Facebook and making sure we're feeding the machine. Next, we're gonna talk about how we scale up. So we've talked about reducing costs uh, for the traffic from Facebook and Google. Uh, now we're just gonna look at how we scale up. The first way to do that is through finding more routes to market. Uh, so that could be new campaigns, um, or it could be new channels, it could be anything like that. But what we do at Door 4 is try to make sure that we've got a testing methodology in place at all times with our clients to ensure we can scale up, as it said. Showed this graph earlier uh, very quickly, but I'm sure you'll all remember it, as I'm sure you've all got photographic memories and, and taking this all down very quickly. But what this graph did show was the sort of short-term effects in the yellow and the long-term uh, brand building uh, activity in the in the red. And I like to think that this sort of negative that you get from this investment when you're doing brand building is investing in testing. It's investing in new things that you can do with your marketing. Um, and I think that's where we see long-term growth. If you read this study, there's a there's a there's there's another graph uh, that shows these two working hand in hand as well. And I think that's what you've got to do really is make sure that you've got short-term activation alongside brand building over the long term. So how do we do it? So Basically, we put in place um, a testing framework. And again, this 
isn't rocket science. Anyone can draw up a spreadsheet like this. Uh, it's just making sure that we've got ideas in the pipeline, we've got uh, months laid out, and then we've got what we call business as usual. So going back to that point I made earlier about hunkering down, these are the bankers, these work. So we'll stick with them and we're gonna be aggressive on them. Um, but these ones we're not sure about. They're good ideas, they're areas we may wanna test, shopping ads or new search ads. It could be Bing, it could be Facebook, it could be different areas completely. Um, but let's test them. So let's have a methodical approach to that. So what do we do? We make sure we've got acceptance criteria because too often um, we'll see it in the industry, someone will turn TikTok on for a, a day and go, oh, I've spent loads of money. I'll turn it off and never do it again. I think what we need to do is make sure that we've got some medium term vision here, uh, which is about, a, you know, we look at about a three month cycle for this kind of stuff, depending on traffic volume, depending on the industry. Um, but month one, let's stick the course, make sure that it comes in with your acceptance criteria. So for this client, as an example, the return on ad spend might need to be um, 500% uh, to be a BAU member. But in month one, as long as it's 200%, it's acceptable, you know, because we can optimize it. It gives us time to optimize it. It gives us time to work out which parts of it are effective. But in month two, it better be at 350% because by month three, we need to be at 500%. So this is just taking a methodical approach to trying to be fleet footed at the same time as being scientific in what we do. I think, like I said earlier, a lot of businesses try something and then turn it off forever. Uh, whereas if you be a bit more methodical, you'll find, as, you'll find as many winners as losers, but you know, at least you'll be growing and scaling as per this graph. Um, so that's it in terms of uh, testing methodology for advertising. The other side of scaling up is making sure that we're cranking the nozzle on the other side, which is our website, you know, making sure that we're testing that. Um, so we're big believers in A-B testing websites. You can see here, uh, the left-hand side graph is uh, an illustrative graph, uh, but it's, you know, cost per click inflation is a thing in the market, both Facebook and Google. Um, I've not yet seen them put their prices down, put it that way. More people use it every day in terms of advertising. So it's just becoming more competitive on all them platforms driving the cost per click up. What we want to do is make sure that our conversion rate is going up at the same sort of pacing. Uh, and we want to make sure that we're keeping up at least, uh, never mind trying to overtake it and improve the return on our spend and the uh, return on investments year on year. Um, we believe in Facebook, Google, digital advertising, you need to do conversion rate optimization just to keep up sometimes. Uh, and an illustrative example of that, so just taking a, a, an illustration, um, you can see here the conversions in CPA are actually flat year on year. We're spending the same amount of money, but we've got to get that conversion rate up by 9.5% because you know what? The CVC has come up 35 pence. It's come up uh, 10%. So because that's up, you know, this needs to come up as well. So we need to always be balancing this, the books. And that's why we think, you know, the website has to be tested. It has to crank everything we can out of it, make sure we're being as persuasive as possible all the time through the website. And what that looks like, uh, just this quick illustrative example from a client of ours uh, in its simplest form, what I'm talking about here is A-B testing. So we've got the control here. Every button on the website is blue. We've got a mixed example here where we've got um, a yellow uh, button for the core CTA and then these black buttons for lesser CTAs. And then we've just turned everything into this burnt orange um, as, the, um, uh, as another variant. Um, and that was the winning variant at the end, you know, so we know that through putting, and these weren't the only ones we did, we did about, uh, I think, nine variations of all different combinations. Um, but, you know, a 26% uplift in people clicking on this button is massive for that client. You know, um, that reduces the CPA um, quite dramatically because we're pushing people through the website a lot quicker and more, more efficiently. And now for the bonus round. So I've gone through my five rules. I'll wrap them up again in a second. Uh, but the bonus round here is, you know, do organic strategies as well. There's loads of stuff you can do today. Just, you know, with a keyboard, you can do loads of stuff yourself. It's not about throwing money at Google and Facebook all the time. Um, content is hard because I think people overestimate it. They overthink it. They, they um, get concerned with it. But it's, it is a low barrier to entry uh, and it, you can therefore do lots of trial and error, lots of errors, um, and just get it out there. Just put loads of noise out in the industry because at least they're hearing from you. Whereas if you're just in your office, not pushing anything out into the world, who's gonna come up and, and try and buy from you? Um, so post on social, it's free. Just do, you know, it's not just about the ads, it can be free. So post whatever you're writing, whatever you're doing, publish loads of content. Um, and then just get someone on the side to help you with your technical SEO, make sure that someone's guiding you in terms of making sure your website's fit for purpose. 
Because through doing that, we ensure that um, you're getting free traffic and what's a better cost per lead than free leads. Um, so I, I'm oversimplifying the point, but you get the point. It's not all about advertising. Um, and then a nice cartoonist uh, cartoon that you can all read at your own leisure. Um, and then the final point I wanted to make on that is um, two quotes from, again, this, I've left all the sources in of uh, where we've got data from. Um, but the average website conversion rate is twice that for people that don't use content. When it says non-users here, it's talking about use content marketing. Um, so that's crazy. You know, it shows that if you're articulating yourself effectively, if you're being persuasive, you'll see higher conversion rates through your website because you're thinking more about what you're putting into your website. It's not just there as a vessel. It's there as part of your business. It's there as an asset. Um, and then annual growth in unique site traffic is up near enough eight times. Uh, for mark content marketers who are seen as leaders rather than followers as well. Um, so making sure that you're thinking about what your content should be, not just trying to copy your competitor. To sum up, I'm here, I've done it. I think it was just over 16 seconds per slide, but I'm here. Um, so don't talk to the wrong people, uh, rule number one. Rule number two, feed the machine when it comes to Facebook or social advertising, whether that's LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, Instagram, just keep putting content into it. Now I'm not saying use all them platforms, but make sure whichever platform you are using, you're feeding that one. Um, avoid becoming wallpaper, you know, and just being that thing that they scroll past and ignore. You need to stand out and you'll do that through fresh content. Um, in search understanding quality score really matters. If you don't know what quality score is, but you're running search campaigns as you speak, you need to go and investigate quality score um, and try and affect it or come to us and we can help. Um, Having a testing framework that'll uh, help you find new ways to market as well. So it's not just about sticking to what you're doing, it's about finding new ways, but having a methodical approach to it. And then getting traffic is only part of the equation. We've got to make sure our website's effective. Um, and then to the last point, you need to make sure that you have a brand voice, that you're publishing content. You know, Don't be scared to just you know, put stuff out in the world uh, frequently. Thanks for your time. Sorry, that was quick. Super, thanks very much for that, Sean. Um, that's a fantastic presentation. We were timing you. I think you managed 16 seconds for most of them, but we'll, we'll have a chat after. Uh, I'm going to invite Nick and Lauren to uh, join us to jump back in for, for Q&A. We've had a few questions dropped in chat and uh, from a couple of other channels. So uh, as, as these guys drop back in, hi, welcome back. Um, we'll just be a few more minutes. Thanks, everybody, for, for sticking around. I think most of our uh, attendees are still here. Um, so a couple of questions. Uh, Lauren, I think there's there's one for you from uh, Paul in, uh, in in the Q and A. So you've you've mentioned quite a lot about uh, accountability across sales and marketing teams. Um, Paul's question really is: uh, given that as soon as you invite a number of people to be accountable for for something, you tend to get well, what I would call bystander syndrome, where oh, somebody else has got it, somebody else has got hold of that that particular issue. Um, well, how do you how do you what do you think about uh, assigning accountability across those teams to get the best results? Yeah, um, I think it's a question that has a couple of parts to the answer. So, of course, um, you know, you want to make sure in the beginning who is accountable for what. And of course, we try to do that. Um, but really getting clarity on um, exactly who takes care of which individual roles and why, um, I think is very important. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, you know, the feedback meetings and, and especially, you know, setting up reports and doing analysis, um, you know, I think it's easy to say that as well, but I think ultimately it's actually leadership um, who should be the ones who are ultimately accountable for those, um, for those marketing results um, or who are, who are, who are accountable for, for MQLs. Um, you know, we need to, leadership is actually going to need to be accountable for creating a culture, um, that kind of culture where we don't, send blame um you know we don't we don't blame each other for for you know what things going wrong but actually you know fostering a culture of um you know feedback and and then you know an open space i guess where you know we can we can look at things um quite clearly which is obviously why it's important to have the right reports and have a way to track things um you know having the right systems in place that, that enable you to do that Brilliant. Yeah. So I think, I, as I would par probably paraphrase as well, that it's still about human beings being responsible and for the organization to have that, that view over that accountability rather than think a piece of software, a bit of MarTech is going to solve all of our problems. 
Brill. Thanks, thanks for that, Lauren. Um, Nick, I think while we're speaking about marketing technology, um, your presentation, I think, really went in, in depth into that engagement, into people and into uh, intent and capturing that. Maybe, I think some of our attendees might be interested to know what kind of tech stack you guys use at, at this type of scale. Yeah, so obviously because we're working for a big global company, uh, they're using paid for tools, but uh, so the main one they use for um, their marketing automation is Adobe Campaign, but they tie that into Adobe Experience Manager, Adobe Analytics, et cetera, et cetera, which is, which is expensive, especially at a global scale, but which uh, is useful for us because what you can do is if somebody gets an email through Adobe Campaign, we can track them in the website through Adobe Analytics and we can use that information to help us serve the next email to them. You can do that anyway without having a joined up ecosystem. It just makes it a bit quicker and easier because it's all integrated in theory. I mean, they're never as good as they say they are on the box, but with, with enough, that's where, that's where our jobs lie, right? Um, but, it, but it does help you kind of understand a bit more about what people are doing outside of, their, uh, outside of just their behavior in one channel. The thing that, interestingly enough, you might find interesting anyway, BMW AG, the group, basically, don't have a DMP yet. They've just started setting one up for this year. So they're in the process of having one. And when that comes live, I think it'll be a huge game changer for them. We've told them the kind of things that they'll be able to do and they've already got, you know, eyes are lighting up. So hopefully that'll change things for us as well in terms of what we're doing with them. Fantastic. Cheers, Nick. Um, and I think just, just uh, sorry, just closing that, just um, a final question for Sean, just looking over here in the chat. Um, You've spoken about Facebook and Google advertising. Uh, what is your view on LinkedIn advertising uh, as a means of targeting specific contacts uh, within key industries, particularly for those those B two B members of our audience today? I have a few views on LinkedIn. Uh, one is which is uh, it's a poor advertising platform uh, in terms of uh, the interface. You know, to actually use it is uh, horrible. Um, but that's not to say it's not an effective marketing tool. Um, I do think you've got a in the digital age, it's less about, um, it's more about the audience, as I've said, and you know, your audience will still use Facebook, right? Just cause they're not, um, you know, talking, they're not in the business world. They, you know, when they're in Facebook, they're not in that mindset. Um, doesn't mean that that's not your audience and who you should be targeting. So we find that B2B markets can be very effective in Facebook. Uh, and it typically, uh, I don't want to speak for all industries, but it typically can be a much cheaper uh, cost per acquisition and definitely cost per traffic. Um, but LinkedIn does have its place. Uh, I've just found in, in my experience using it, um, the targeting you have to put in place to get to where you want to get to with it, because it's a poor advertising platform, like, let's not get away with that. You know, LinkedIn have never really optimized the actual platform. Um, it becomes expensive. It becomes really expensive to actually get to a, a worthwhile audience. Uh, you may as well go after a more generic demographic-based audience in Facebook, uh, which will bring your CBCs right down. That's typically what I find, but I, you know, I have run campaigns that work quite well on LinkedIn. Real. And you're not off the hook, Sean, because we have one final question that's coming from our Facebook live stream from Kevin. Uh, so uh, you, you mentioned about doing what works and not not just following new new trends ad hoc, which I think we'd all agree is, is certainly good course advice. But, you know, how do you judge when a new platform or feature or trend does become relevant? You know, what's that decision making process? I think it's getting into that pipeline of the testing methodology to say, you know, making sure that, you know, if we feel like TikTok's relevant to our audience, we should know who our audience is. That's the key, right? You know, if our audience is, you know, 18 to 21, um, I don't know the TikTok audience. I'm not part of it myself. I'm not going to lie. Uh, but if it's 18 to 21, then, you know, that's our audience, then yeah, sure, we should test it. Uh, but it goes into the pipeline of testing methodology. We give it a trial and we make sure that it's got KPIs surrounding it to make sure it's, it's palatable. What I find frustrating in the industry is we turn on a TikTok or a LinkedIn or a Twitter and go, oh, well, I did that for, you know, seven days and that didn't work, did it? Did you give it a KPI? Did you give it an objective? Did you really put a hypothesis against what you were expecting to get out of it? And typically the answer to all them questions is no, we just thought it would be cool. Um, so that's kind of where I get to with that stuff. So, yeah, I think it's, it's I, the industry will constantly change and we need to always bring in these new platforms. And uh, that's where we will grow as businesses. We'll find new routes to get in front of our audiences. But I, I think you need to test it effectively. 
Oh yeah, everything was new once, wasn't it? So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. that brings us to the end of our time. I'd really like to thank uh, Lauren, Nick, and Sean for joining us today, and thanks to everybody that, that's attended and taken part in uh, in today's episode of Decoding Digital. Um, we we've got our next event coming up, which will be usually in about uh, about eight weeks. We've not publicised the date yet, but we're we're hoping to get that confirmed in the next week or so. So we welcome any suggestions for speakers or topics from those of you that are, that are here in attendance today. We try and make this about you and answering the questions that you, that you really want. Um, so thanks again to our speakers. Thanks for everybody for coming. And we're going to close now and we'll see you soon. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.